Hello, listeners. And you may be catching this on a link from the Lighting Controls Podcast website, lightingcontrolspodcast.com. Or you may be listening to this on the Get a Grip on Lighting feed. And what I'm here to tell you today is that the conversation series that Greg and I started back in January 2022 is, is, is coming to an end. And I'm very happy to say that Ronald Kuzmar and Webster Marsh are, are now launching their own podcast. And it's going to be called the Lighting Controls Podcast. And so if you're interested in this topic, you may want to go to lightingcontrolspodcast.com, spelled the way it sounds. And there's, it's available on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, uh, Google Podcasts, and plenty of other places as well. And we want to tell you about our friends at the Lighting Controls Association. It's a council of NEMA, and they are the presenter of this show. And so they have um, decided to help us in the creation of this and help this movement along. And... Also, it is financially supported by the good folks at the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. That's right, NEILD.org is kicking in on this one as well. And so I'd like to say hello right now to your new hosts, Webster Marsh and Ronald Kuzmar. How's it going, guys? Good. How are you doing? Well, well, before I set you guys loose, because I know you have, you know, the, 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 the world in front of you here on this topic and... <laughs> It's really interesting. I think we have to go to our friends at toggle.com. That's T O G G L E D.com. They're the first sponsor. Isn't it great that we're kicking it off on the first episode, Ron, with a sponsor? I'm really happy that Toggle stepped up. No, it's fantastic. They're, they're great. You know, the guys are great. We've spent a bunch of time with them already. They have some fantastic products, and I'm really excited to have them on board. Yeah, and they're part of a global tech leadership that provides software and cloud solutions. Um, for IoT and high performance computing, data analytics and AI, uh, they they started. You may know about more of this more than more than me, Ron. They started uh, their approach with NLC. Now, I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? What do they I mean do when they say NLC? Added to then added network radio lighting to, controls. Network. Oh, lighting there we controls. go. There we go. See, we're we're starting to read off, and they <laughs> they added radio to their linear lamps and expanded from there. Um, their linear lamps now feature Bluetooth, and I got a couple of them here in my shop, and we're playing around with them. We're seeing what these things can do, and that's what this show is about, is to start setting out the business case for this. Um, they have direct wire retrofits that are just a tube swap away from adding controls, and that's really exciting for the built environment, the already built environment. Wireless, of course, Bluetooth mesh. Um, their data drives moving forward, these BMS controls they've had, they, I don't know that much about it, but there's these boxes that you can link multiple different devices to that you can then Bluetooth control. Fabulous stuff like that, multiple voltages. Um, there's no need for an API integration, and it's a truly customer-centric approach to network lighting controls. So toggled views buildings holistically versus segmented systems. So I think they're looking for that longer term play to be integrated into the building systems. And I know that this show is probably gonna talk a lot about that. And before I let you guys loose, tell me a little bit about why Webster Marsh, why are you doing this? Get the word out there, get people excited about lighting controls and thinking about them in, in a clear manner and understand them a little bit more. Ron. Yeah, he, he hit it, right? There's a lot of mystery around control. So we want to really clear things up, bring some education to the forefront and help people understand what they're buying, why they're buying, the, the roles the different parties play, integrators, designers, everybody, and really just help bring this whole thing to the forefront because controls are really going to start taking off more than they have been. Yeah, there's a feeling. I often talked about the, the lighting controls boom bust cycle. Um, and I've mentioned it before. This one, feel, this you know, you, you know, this time's going to be different. I actually think it might be different this time. I, I feel like there's a lot of momentum behind it, and I think that it's an exciting time. So um, I'm going to tell you, list, remind all your listeners again that the Lighting Controls podcast is on the Get a Grip on Lighting feed for a limited time. We don't even know how long. Maybe three, four, five episodes, and then they're going to be on their own. And we want to thank Toggled. So go to t o g g l e d dot com for their solutions. And now I give you. Webster Marsh and Ronald Kuzmar, the hosts of the Lighting Controls podcast. Off you go, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, it's great that we have this podcast uh, to be able to talk about lighting controls. I mean, we've been talking about lighting controls for pretty much up until now with the conversation series. But now that we're doing uh, the full podcast, it's pretty much the same. But now we're really focusing in on 
what are lighting controls? What makes them interesting? Why are we talking about them? You know, we've had a lot of great interviews so far throughout the conversation series where we've talked to the different players within the design bid build specification world and the installation world as well. So, you know, it's a question of where do we go from here? Is there is there a ceiling? Is there a floor? What what is the the point of a podcast about lighting controls, especially because it doesn't seem to be a consistent thing out there? You know, there's a lot of manufacturer provided information out there um, on their specific products, but what we're doing is we're really expanding out on the conversation and covering a lot more agnostic material than saying this device from this manufacturer. Yeah, you know, and I really think we're trying to focus on the holistic approach as well, right? We're we're not while we're talking about lighting controls, we're really talking about controls in general and what more can those controls do for you? What additional mm -hmm. data can you get from those sensors? What additional triggers can that sensor send a command to somebody else, right? So, it's lighting controls, but it's controls in general and I don't know that there is a ceiling for some of this, right? I, you know, to be honest, like there's so much infancy in this industry that there's so much that can change and there's so much that needs to change, right? There's, there's a lot of proprietary information. There's a lot of proprietary control systems. And in order to really move this industry forward, a lot of that needs to change and there needs to be more open source. And, and until we start to see a lot of that, you're still going to have a lot of fights and battles between manufacturers and equipment. And, and that's really where the education really comes into play, right? That's where we're helping, trying to help people understand and, and have a more clear picture so that they don't get caught down some of these roads that, that lead to, you know, the not greatest end results. Right. Well, and, and it's not, that's not just your opinion. I mean, based on the conversations we've had so far with people, that's sort of, a, a need that's growing within our industry where people are saying we need non-proprietary resources. Educators are, are asking for it. Installers are asking for it. Specifiers are asking for it. And manufacturers in some cases are asking for it. And so, you know, the, the more we can push towards that and achieve that, the better. But at the same time, part of that ceilingless experience that we have in this industry is a result of burgeoning technology constantly entering the marketplace. And so as we develop new technology, as we develop new standards, we're going to see which direction is going to make the most sense and be more, more frictionless for the manufacturers to be able to provide solutions that meet that demand. And additionally, because of energy code, there's a motivation that is not just by interest, it's by demand of the state or the authority having jurisdiction that you must comply with this requirement. And the manufacturers are also trying to meet that demand at the same time. Yeah, and that's a really important thing. And that's not something that every state is currently dealing with, right? I mean, various states are dealing with various codes. And, and that is unfortunately part of the problem is most of the manufacturers are trying to meet codes that are often being set in California and not being applied everywhere else. So you've got some discrepancy there uh, as to what is ultimately going to happen. Which way is all of this going to go? There's a, we haven't gotten there yet, but there's a lot of questions around network security. And, and what does that do to some of these control systems? And there are multiple manufacturers that have different takes on some of the security statutes for networked controls that California has, and other manufacturers are not yet implementing them, don't believe they're going to become. So right, I know that's a conversation we're going to have so, somebody soon, but you know, these are things that, you know, that are going to come up and, and are coming up. And so there's, a, there's just a lot of information to go through right now. And it's also very easy to get overwhelmed by that information. And so that's another part of this podcast that we're trying to do is to provide people with a framework of understanding for what is contextually important when it comes to lighting controls as a, a 10,000 foot, 
foot view versus a hundred foot view. You know, if if I'm a specifier, what what's important for me to know about UL requirements for cybersecurity? Well, you know, we should be talking to someone about that, and we do have we do have somebody on the list that we can talk about. But you know, it's really the the table the the landscape of lighting controls is really shifting a lot and you know yeah in the early 90s we had one way of doing lighting controls and it was pretty consistent but now you know it's kind of open territory for for various approaches to doing lighting controls and additionally it's not you know without energy code compliance being involved we have other things such as multimedia experiences or you know pixel mapping or all of this additional layering on top of just your standard architectural systems that demands a lot more out of your designers than it used to be yeah it, it, there really is there's a lot more that's put been put in front of the designers as to what they need to think about and worry about right it's not just what is the foot candle or lux on the floor anymore right it's it's right. very much changed from what it was you know and it, it'll be interesting to see sort of where things go but you know we've already had a conversation in one of our episodes where you know the the manufacturer when they went offline all of their systems bricked right so that brings right. another side to this whole thing about having open source and, and being able to be able to be compatible with other people's technologies you can't have a system that just bricks when it loses connectivity to the internet or if the company folds or right these systems have to be standalone and they need to function you know by themselves outside of that sort of larger world and so that's you know another problem that needs to be addressed by some of these manufacturers and we've also seen you know what happened with microsoft silverlight when it disappeared and what is happening what's happened just in the last two years with chipsets how many manufacturers have had to go back to UL multiple times for the same product because they'd get a new chip and then they can't get it. And then they get another new chip and then they can't get it. We've seen products discontinued completely because of this. So a lot's changed alone just in the last two years. And I think it, because of that, it's almost like there's a bit of a reset with some of the manufacturers because the fact that it used to be, oh, well, if I if I use manufacturer X, I know that their products are going to be, you know, the the way that they um, kind of phase out their products is a slow process. And so I know that I can rely upon them to to provide these products later on if if one of them breaks but now because of this chip shortage it's almost like we're going back to the beginning with some of these manufacturers because it's like well i can't provide a replacement for that it's impossible and so it almost is fertile ground for the the newer manufacturers to come in and say well you know we don't have legacy products yet but you know we can do x y and z and right. There's no stand back where the, the manufacturer, the bigger manufacturer can say, well, you know, you're newer, you don't have the legacy products, you haven't proven your warranty is, is covering anything. But at the same time, it's like, well, nobody's warranty is covering anything right now. Yeah, right. That is that is definitely hard part of the problem right now is, uh, you know, it, it's true. There's so many products that were here yesterday and gone today, and there's no support now because they can't get the the chips, they can't right. get the pieces. Like so, that has been very difficult lately um, for a lot of people, and it's it's caused a lot of it's caused a lot of heartache for people. It's caused a lot of redesign um, from designers to have to go back and figure out new control systems or new lighting systems altogether because components aren't available. So it's, um, and then with long lead times, it's really made this right. challenging. Or God forbid you're on a project and um, your, your system that you've spent, you know, months buttoning up is getting replaced because your lead times are too long and so now you have to review the submittal of a completely different system that you never specified because they can deliver within the window that the project needs and you need to rely upon resources to vet that because you can't just go in cold and review it 
you have to talk to your sales agent. You need to talk to the manufacturer. You need to talk to integrators who are familiar with the product. And that's a lot of time and effort that, that you need to take out of your project billing to, to achieve because of the fact that lead times are just so long in some cases. Yeah. And, and that's really where you hope too that manufacturers have all their spec sheets online and up to date. <laughs> Right. And current, you know, current, up to date, yep. accurate information. That's been a challenge for people is just, you know, trying to stay up on some of that stuff and make sure that they're actually putting out all the correct information. And that's that's a challenge, too, because if you are used to just re reviewing and reading spec sheets as an engineer and you're not necessarily used to calling on a rep or anything like that, and you start reading through all these spec sheets and realize that the information wasn't all accurate, that's that's been providing some issues as well. Well, and I think as we've heard from the educators that we've interviewed, there's a lack of consistency for terminology. And so yes. as a result of that, reading a cut sheet from manufacturer A may not be reading a cut sheet from manufacturer B. They may use the same word to mean different things, or they may use different words to mean the same things. And as right. a result, it's almost like you need a glossary for each manufacturer's definitions. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's very true, actually. Right? That has come up a couple of times, unfortunately. Um, and that and right. And that is ultimately part of what we're hoping to to help do here with this show. Right. Is is education and and start to, you know, hopefully get people to use the same terminology and, and start to sort of help in our way to move the industry forward. Right. However, that may be and whatever piece of that we can do, but whatever we can do to really educate and help assist yeah. and move this industry forward is really what we're trying to do. Well, so out of curiosity, this was not a pre-planned question. So I'm, I'm asking <laughs> you cold, Ron, what word out of all of the words that we use in our industry, would you like to see standardized so that everybody agrees what it means? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> wow. I, huh. Wow, yeah, you really put me on the spot there. Um, <laughs> I'm man, I'm not sure. There are man, I am well, give not me one. Sure. Maybe not the top one, but give me one word that bugs the crap out of you. <sighs> okay, well, so integrator is a word. While I call myself <laughs> one, it is a word that drives me nuts because everyone uses it in a different manner. Everyone refers to an integrator. What What is the integrator's role? Define integrator. That is probably a, a great one right now, right? I mean, we I refer to myself as an integrator, but people use that word and have different meanings based on even just the industry. So engineers, especially, not to pick on them, tend to use integrator in different manners than we do in the lighting industry, right? And that's just part of what it is because to them, an integrator does a different role than what we consider that to be. Right. No, I, I agree. I think integrator needs a, a solid definition or at least an array of definitions with different identifiers so that yep. we know what we're talking about. I mean, I know people throw out systems integrator sometimes, and that yep. that person usually refers to a building automation, building management integrator who does multiple systems and puts their hands on the equipment. Right. Um, but it's not a defined uh, role. No. You know, if I say systems integrator to you, it may mean something completely different to if I speak to an engineer versus if I speak to an architect. So yep. there's there's not a consensus when we were using that word, and I, I agree. Um, right. Also, the synonymous word integration. Yep. When we're talking about integration, <laughs> that is also something that people have different expectations for that. Yep. Yep. I, and it, I would go as far as even the term networked lighting controls, right? Or is it, is it hardwired network? Is it a mesh? Is it wireless? Is it wired? Is it actually IP based or is it networked via some other communication like a lawn protocol? Like there's just, that one's always been kind of a tough one. People have been using that for years as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, user interface device definitions bug me like vacancy sensor you know mm -hmm. yes we technically have a definition for vacancy sensor if you look at title 24 for instance 
Mm -hmm. but there's no consensus in our industry right now other than that and right. so that's one thing that that i would like to see a more standardized definition for as well as are we saying daylight sensor daylight harvesting yeah. <laughs> photo sensor photo you know what what are we calling that device that detects light and adjusts right. the illumination in the space based on that light <laughs> right and then where is it detecting the light from right right closed yeah. loop versus it... open loop exactly yeah, yeah. right yeah no so I, that, that's I, I... <laughs> those are those are my <laughs> hopes but i mean i think ultimately we have to see standardization with these definitions mm -hmm. because of the fact that we run into issues when there's a lack of consensus and those issues become the industry's issues. It's not just, oh, well, you had a different definition from me, so eggs on your face. Eggs on everyone's face when a lighting control system fails because right. people don't just, I mean, people do associate manufacturer names with, with bad experiences, but for the most part, it's, it's, I don't want a complex lighting control system. Yeah. And the reason yeah. you hear that is because they were sold on a complex lighting control system at one point and it did not execute the way they wanted it to. Right. right. And that's, that is also then taking that next leap into the standardization of documentation, right? Because yes. not everyone documents their system the same way from the beginning, right? What is the control intent? What is this system supposed to do? How is it supposed to operate so that when the integrator or the programmer or commissioning agent or whoever comes in to program this system, they have an idea of what they're doing based on the owner's wishes, the architect or the engineer's wishes, right? And, and, and that documentation needs to exist. And some firms are better about it than others, but there's no, she can't say no, not anymore. They, they're working on it, right? But Well, so, I mean, we've got a great interview coming up for sure on documentation and standardizing documentation. The IES yep. has released some great guidance on how to do that in a yep. way that is going to be effective, but we're at the beginning. Yes. We're seeing it coming out now. So that means that there's going to be other documents, other guidance out there that is yet to, to be seen. And so to your point, we're, we're gonna evolve and we're gonna we're gonna make that a priority as we go forward because the intent that the owner has in mind needs to align with what is documented. Right. And and people need to understand too with the bid spec world that some of these documents might not see the light of day for two years, three years, right? I mean, you you've got another two years, three years worth of projects that are out there currently with their existing lack mm -hmm. of documentation, right? That are still going to be out there and still going to frustrate people and give owners a hard time. And so this is not an overnight fix, right? These things take time. So for anyone who's not in that bid spec world, it's, it's going to take a little bit. Well, but I mean, even for people who are in design build, there is still that need to confirm. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, fine. You don't have to bid the project anymore. So you don't need the out the window bid documents. But at the same time, you do need to confirm and verify that what you're going to be giving is meeting what the owner wants. And having the conversation with the owner, as we found with our interviewees, is hard to do when you're hired directly by them, let alone if you're a contractor who's a sub of another contractor or, you know, any other scenarios, you know, being able to extract the information you need from the person who has that information is daunting at times. And so hopefully we're also going to see guidance on how to achieve what, you know, getting that information, you know, what are best practices for having a conversation with an owner for their project requirements? Um, because that's also a hurdle that needs to be overcome. Yeah, no, that's really true because it is hard to have those conversations with owners because a lot of times you're dealing with one or two people or a small team and they don't always have all that information. They don't have all those answers. They don't know how 
you know, teacher A in this classroom wants to use this space or how they want to use the gym or how they want to set up these open offices or, I mean, there's just, there's so many questions to be asked in every scenario. And a lot of these owners, unfortunately, haven't had to think through all this. And then, so you get some maybe idea from them and you program it. And then a month or two down the road, you get the phone call that they don't like anything and they want everything <laughs> redone. It happens all the time. Uh, right. And it's just, or you get the, the owner who just does stuff on their own and overrides everything in a way that breaks everything. R right. Yeah. Right. So there's that, right. So there's a lot of that and, and that's not their fault. Right. A lot of this is, is no. either lack of those conversations happening early, um, them not having paperwork, documentation, standards to sort of refer back to, to get an idea of some of the questions to ask themselves, their team, things to think about. So it's so much more than just, you know, the engineers and the designers, right? There's, there's so much more documentation and information that needs to be provided to everybody on these projects. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of movement in our industry when it comes to lighting controls and we're seeing the beginnings of something maybe bigger and better and hopefully at the end of the road more satisfying to people with lighting controls because right now there's a lot of pain in every role when it comes to lighting controls and you know that's why we're talking about it you know because of this just frustration that people have or uh, lack of clarity, confusion. But also, you know, there is, again, a lot of excitement and a lot of people are enthusiastic about lighting controls, as we've found with theatrical designers who are migrating from the theater world into our industry. I mean, you and I are perfect examples of that. But even yep. now, you know, there's more overlap with programmers who are doing you know, like hog programming or grand MA programming on architectural systems. Yep. And as a result, you're getting that theatrical element put into a permanent installation. And so their, their day job is a theatrical programmer, but their moonlighting or doing as a side hustle architectural program. Yep. Yep. And so, and you, you know, you, we, we are seeing that overlap. Yeah. And you're going to see more and more of it as more and more people introduce color changing LED lighting on outside of the space, inside of the space, video walls, right? You name it as it becomes more, the word I love to use, architainment, right? As it becomes <laughs> more architainment, you're going to see more and more of that because it's no longer a space that's just something your your average sort of I don't want to that's probably not the right word you, your typical lighting designer is going to necessarily uh, be well I think the, the best person with you know I think we're already seeing the the signs of specialization within our industry yeah. where you know okay you may just do classrooms all day long or you may just do multimedia walls all day long yes and so that is something that is important to to keep in mind is that we can't just say lighting designer anymore right you know we have to clarify you know do you do just commercial office spaces do you do airports you know and that's the same with lighting controls you can't just do architectural lighting controls anymore no no you you really can't right and and each one Having started up many different lighting systems where there is a very different sort of sequence and rhythm to doing a classroom or an office than there is to an arena, right? There's, it's just, it's a very different atmosphere. It's a very different way to handle them. The way that those individual systems are commissioned and programmed is very different. And the way they're designed is obviously very different. So there is a lot more specialty and, and that is going to be a lot of the conversations we're going to have is making sure that you've got the right people, the right team, the right individuals on board for your project to make sure that you have a successful project. Absolutely. And so, you know, 
that's just sort of a quick taste of what we're planning for this podcast. I mean, we're going to see how the conversation evolves, how people respond. People are always welcome to reach out with questions, or if they want to be on the show, they're welcome to reach out. We want to hear from you. We want to talk to you. There, There's so much to talk about, and we've got the time to talk about it. So please let us know your thoughts. But otherwise, just wait and see what else we got cooked for you. So we've just heard from Webb and Webster and Ron about the importance of the show and why they're doing it and what they're looking to accomplish. But we want to we wanna give our thanks to our sponsor, Toggled, T-O-G-G-L-E-D dot com. Global leader, Ron and Webster. Um, grassroots approach to NLC. Now, I've learned my first thing from the Lighting Controls podcast. That stands for Network Lighting Controls. Um, they've added radio to their linear lamps and expanded from there, right? And I think that I think that you know that early phase when all the companies were coming up and Toggle was one of them, and now we're into Bluetooth mesh systems. Now we're into addressable addressable systems. And then you guys were talking about early on the show about combining all these different systems. And Toggle is one of those partners you can work with. Um, they have uh, their BMS controls, which you know I don't really understand yet, to be honest with you. Uh, it was demoed to me, but I think it's something that we need to sink our teeth into and how to connect mm-hmm. these things all together, guys. Cybersecurity certificates obtained. That's always a big question. I'm sure it's going to come up on the show here a lot. And so they've got their ahead on that. And they have an API integration that has no fees. And customer-centric approach, I know that because I work with them. And um, they, they, they view the building the same way you do, holistically instead of segmenting the system. So we're going to say thank you. Toggled, that's togled, T-O-G-G-L-E-D.com. And how important, I'm going to go to Webster first. How important is it to have the Lighting Controls Association, a council of DEMA involved in this Webster? Oh, it's absolutely important. I mean, they're part of the forefront of getting education on lighting controls out there. They help generate content for any role within the industry, but especially designers and contractors to be able to understand lighting controls. They work directly with the manufacturers to make sure that the information is helpful and coherent and consistent. And I'm also a contributor of them and I can't say enough good things about them. You know, you gotta you gotta really like industry associations. Um, and we thank Charles Knufke, I think I pronounced his last name correctly. <laughs> I and think you're Craig, right. And Craig DeLuey and the rest of the board uh, and the council over at LCA for working with us on this. And, you know, before we, we give away too many secrets, Ron, how important are associations and what do they do for this, you know, nailed being involved and stepping up and providing the producers? You know, tell me a little bit about that, Ron, from your perspective and, and how we, how thankful we are for those folks. No, it's huge. I mean, I, I, I couldn't be more thankful for, for all of this, right? And for nailed stepping up and, and, and doing all this. And the associations are so big for all of this. And, and part of it is not everyone knows about every association, mm. right? I, I, it was, it was not too many episodes ago during the conversation series that I owned up to the fact that I didn't know about the LCA for many years. Right. So, mm. and, and coming from a different world than Webster, right. Being sort of, uh, you know, the, the installer versus designer, right. I didn't necessarily know everything about the LCA. So it's been really great to get to know those guys and and sort of get to know nailed and and sort of see all this and and understand the benefit that all these associations bring and education is the forefront of what all of these associations bring and that's what we're trying to do here too so the more that we can do to sort of help bring people to these various associations to nail to lca and sort of get the word out there and let them know that this education's there right it, it, it's all out there there's so much documentation and education out there and it, it's great you know so everyone needs to understand join those associations if you can you know figure out which ones are best for you mm. or your company your business get mm. out there join those associations and, and do what you can to sort of help too just to add to well, the education the educate oh go ahead Webster. oh i was just gonna say um even if you can't join as a member you know join their their subscription their news letters and stuff because they always yes. have great information in the, there even if you're just an outsider to lighting controls but you're curious they always have good stuff in there even for people who are at the the fringe and we will we will be posting lighting controls related news on the lighting controls podcast website lightingcontrols.com and if you want to subscribe to this 
All the links are there at the lighting, lighting controls dot com, lighting controls podcast dot com. Check it out. But you know, you talked about education, and I, and I just want to sort of expand that a little bit, just a touch, because you know, frontline lighting practitioners, are, which are you know, call it agents, distributors, contractors, and integrators. I think we'd add to those <laughs> as a guy like yourself, uh, Ron. Um, they also provide education to the industry, and it's something that that we forget. As frontliners, we always think, oh, we're being dictated to, you know, what do we need to learn now? What do we need to learn now? But in fact, what Nailed has shown is that the, the, the distributors actually have a lot to say to the rest of the industry about the direction, about sustainability, about darkness restoration, about lighting controls. And that information, if you're, if you're one of these frontliners, as we say, find your way to Namco if you're a contractor. Find your way into Nailed if you're a distributor. Uh, if you're an agent, go to the American Association of Independent Lighting Agents and, and contribute there because you have a lot of knowledge, especially if you've been in the game for a long time. And especially now if you're an integrator more than ever, that's an evolving profession. And so, uh, or an, uh, what's right? We're not evolving. Mer emerging profession is a lighting or controls integration professional. So I'm really excited about that. And so thank you guys for doing this. And um, yeah, I think we want to say thanks to those three. Toggled.com, uh, Lighting Controls Association, and of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. I'm out. It's the last time you'll see me on this show. Unless I'm a guest, of course. I get invited. <laughs> <laughs>